first slide, that's the name of our group, Actinobacteria Metabolic Engineering Group. So some, some students were motivated to prepare such a wonderful plates. And, and recently also I'm involved intensively. So we have founded the company Explogene, um, working in metabolic engineering of Actinomyositis in Ukraine and, and in Germany, another one, MyBiotech, which, is, which are working on fermentation side of, um, of uh, secondary metabolites. And uh, yes, recently I'm associated with the University of Saarland. Before uh, I start to speak about research, I would like really to, uh, to thank my people who spend the bloody hours in the lab to, uh, to, uh, that I can really stay here and, and present you these results. And I appreciate it very much. We have a tradition in our lab, so if a certain milestone is reached, I bring then people to the place they want. Last time it was in Mallorca, so I, I need to bring the whole group because they reached an excellent milestones, which I will present here. And I'm afraid really what happened next year because they demand to go to Maldiven and for four days, I don't know if I manage it with, with, uh, with my budget. So it was already pointed that we raised a huge problem on antibiotic resistance. And, and I think this graph represented a really, uh, it's really clear how, how, how a big issue is. So it's, uh, the, this is a year where antibiotics have been invented or brought to the market. And then the resistance appears. If you see last decades, you see that immediately after antibiotic was brought to the market, like one, two years it takes to pathogen to develop the resistance. And then, uh, and this issue is, 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 is really huge now. So, and uh, of course there's a, a big decline in antibiotic discovery and development in big pharma. And that's also, it makes it even, even worse. It's why the government, for example, in Germany takes a lot of care about this and put a lot of investment for, for new discovery and development of antibiotics. So where from we can take the antibiotics? So uh, usually the natural products are the major scaffolds for, for, this, uh, for antimicrobials. And here are some examples of, of natural products from actinobacteria, which are the major source of antibiotics. And what usually, what industry and, and many research groups usually um, did, they went to the very interesting places, nice places. So we always try to argue that only there we can, we can get uh, very interesting soil samples and so on. That is usually PIs are doing. And then the, the PhD students have more interesting job and funny job. So they go to the lab and trying to isolate those. So, and, uh, and afterwards, you can indeed end up with the new molecules. But, so, and we are doing this as well. We have a small activity, like two, three PhD students uh, working on the classical way of isolation and, and bioprospecting, etc. You isolate new antibiotics, we, we publish this and so on. But the problem is, and that's one of the reasons why the industry declined the development, is a huge rate of rediscovery of known compounds. So you are working one, two years and then end up with known compounds, etc., etc. And that makes a lot of problems. And that was even, that was even the thoughts. And in the research, you can also read that, that, uh, that actinomyositis particularly, they are exhausted source of, of antibiotics or nat new natural products. But that remember me this picture. So if you look on the sky, so you see by naked eye only 500 stars, right? But intuitively you feel like there should be more behind, right? And, and this is indeed what happened and what scientists discovered when they started to sequence genomes. So an average streptomyces would be able to produce in, in certain conditions in the lab, like two, three, four compounds. But if you look into the genomes, uh, you can find the potential to produce 20, 30, 40 different compounds because they are hidden in the, in the genome. And, and now uh, due to the, the very well uh, established uh, bioinformatic platform, so we can very quickly identify most of these gene clusters. And then, of course, when this was uh, discovered, then came a ba uh, again back interest uh, uh, of industry and then all the groups or many groups started to sequence and sequence and sequence and then you could find such a uh, press releases that Sanofi or other big pharma is investing hundreds of millions of euros or dollars to small companies to develop new natural products etc etc so we also started to do it also start to sequence as every group and, and this this hype but then I read that one and I said okay mm, maybe we should stop because uh, this we cannot outcompete so we should focus on something different. And uh, our focus will be on the exploitation of this genomic potential. Uh, and uh, here I present a very simple concept, which I will try to elaborate today uh, on this. Uh, we will, what we need actually to exploit this biosynthetic potential is very simple, three components. 
First is gene clusters, like David presented excellently, so physically cloned gene clusters. Second, you need some clear, predictable uh, genetic controlling element which will run the expression of those gene clusters. And the third, combining these both components, you need to have a host or chassis to bring this all together and get this expressed isolated compound, right? So this is three components we will, which we'll go through. And I will start with the third one, with the chassis. So it's a very crowded slide. I'll try to explain it briefly. So uh, this is streptomyces albus. It's one of the strain, a modal strain used for heterologous expression, right? And it's produced a whole variety of natural products, which is a big advantage from, for us because we can ensure that all kinds of different precursors are available in the strain to, to enable production of natural products. And, but in, from in the same side, it's also a disadvantage because we have a very crowded uh, metabolic profile. We, this all precursors, so many of them are consumed. It's very hard to make down processing and, and, and to isolate these compounds if you have a very crowded metabolic background. That's why we said, okay, we will delete all of these gene clusters to get rid all of, uh, all of these compounds from Cytomyces albus, and then it became, become, should become better a host. And that indeed what we did. So we, we deleted the gene clusters in this strain using the technology. I'm not discussing today the details. Then we, um, we further improved the strains. I'm also not going to details. If you have a question, it will be interesting. And then started to express the gene clusters. So I, I, will, I will present you some, 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 some details on that. And uh, here just a small, uh, small step aside, so just to show you about uh, cryptic or silent gene clusters, this picture. So this is Streptomyces albus, which we use as a host, a wild type strain. You see this all peaks, right? And uh, this is the medium where we grow the strain. And this is our strain where all the gene clusters have been deleted. That's all what I'm to say about the silent potential, right? So after nearly every gene cluster we have deleted, we observed the disappearance of certain peak, meaning that majority are expressed, majority. And this is not only an example from Streptomyces albus. We have developed the same for levidans, completely get rid of all gene clusters and, all, and also two other strains which we have internally in our lab and uh, so far not published. So as a better horse, so the whole panel and we observe this very often. And you should remember this is only one medium, one temperature, it's only one condition, right? If you would get like several media, several temperatures, some stress factors, I believe that all gene clusters could be expressed and you can get them isolated at the end, which is a little bit more tricky if you have this forest of peaks, right? But still, so you see that our strain has a relatively clean background, so coming from, from the medium, so it would be much more beneficial. So, three components. We have chassis, very well developed chassis. I show example of albus, but we have uh, several more in the same stage. And now we are coming to gene clusters. So I have got a, a pressure test from industry, a big pharma. So I'm, I have, was privileged and, and had a big advantage to work with Sanofi, Pfizer, BSF, Novartis, many, many industrial big companies in, uh, before. And then one big company came and said, Andrew, so there's a discussion about this uh, gene cluster expression, this technology, where we are with this? Could we use it now? And, uh, and then we make a pressure test. They say, okay, now you have 40 streptomyces sequence genomes. So you have three years time, you have certain number of money, amount of money, so like a lot of 1 million euro. This is the resources and please show what you can do with that. How many new scaffolds, how many new compounds you can get from this genomic potential. And then we will evaluate this and this will be a decision for us if we forget about this for next seven, 10 years or we push this technology further. And in parallel, the same strains, we give us to chemist and then go traditional way, isolating compounds, cultivating different conditions, and then we will compare and then say, okay, on which stage we are. That was a pressure, pressure because you need to deliver and second that you are responsible for kind of technology you were pushing last 10 years and it was uh, indeed interesting. And we started. So we start to clone the gene clusters, to express gene clusters, isolate compounds. And the condition was also, you don't need just to show there's a new compound. You should isolate at minimum five to 10 milligram that we can test. So, and it was uh, even more hard. Then we started. So you just take what we did usually. You take uncharacterized gene cluster, right? Which is not described. You believe it might be responsible for, for the um, new compound. And then we started. So expression one gene cluster, known compound. Expressing another uncharacterized gene cluster, known compound. Expressing another uncharacterized gene cluster. We said, okay, maybe you go not to streptomyces, but to Francia, known compound. 
So, and uh, then we said, okay, we go for very unusual gene cluster, uh, trans-AT, PKS, NRPS hybrid, non-compound. So, uh, that was very funny from one side. Uh, students were depressed, but I said, you shouldn't be because you can always publish. It's a new biosynthetic roots. It's very interesting from fundamental point of view. But when we uh, had the first report, they were laughing. They say, of course, of course you get it. And the industry was sort of, because there's many, it was sort of, sort of spirit that it will not bring anything for many people. And uh, it was for us indeed uh, in, uh, frustrated a little bit. So, but we continued. So I want to say this statistic, what I show here, it's based on 200 gene clusters, right, expression. So we could express around 200 gene cluster. We could clone them in one year with a certain number of people. So they gave us. And, but this is not so bad everything, right? So when we, when we dig in deeper, so we could identify, so I'm not showing everything, but for example here, it's a completely new scaffold, very interesting compound. You see this isoquinoline, pyrolinoline ring with the GABA and so on. So it's a very interesting compound we can't really uh, find easily if you would go a classical way. So we could isolate two new scaffolds from, from, from others, um, pseudonocardia and not streptomyces, if you take, and, and for example, from a very simple compound from Frankia. So now this is data like half a year. Now we have another four new scaffolds isolated in like up to 10 milligram tested with the company. So it's getting more and more convincing. And uh, what is really interesting, of course, you get uh, at the beginning of such a project, you get a lot of bottlenecks, right? And then you're removing one by one. And I hope that at the end of the project, which is ending next year, so we will convince industry that we should push this further and we are able to deliver new scaffolds. Yeah, because no one really is interested in new compounds. If you will get new compounds with hydroxy group, methyl group, or something like that uh, additional, so that will be not, uh, not really interesting for the industry. They want to have a new chemotype. And this is what we are pushing now. So I think we have now like uh, four to six because how you want to see the new, a new scaffold. But this result, right, also if you think of this result, then again you should think of this picture. Because although it's more than 500 stars, but even, I, I read it was very interesting for me, that even number of stars are limited, right? So we have 50 trillions. Where from this number comes, I don't know, don't ask me, but I have read this. And I have no reason not to believe. So it's the same with antibiotics, right? And I believe that we have a limited number of natural products, for sure and way more um, limited than the stars on the sky. So that's why I believe, so having this first slide where we express all these uncharacterized gene clusters and got and, and end up with, uh, with known compounds, that we need to treat all these natural products as a limited precious resources, the same like forestry, like fisheries, etc., etc., because we have a limited number of this, and then we need to get use of this. And this is, uh, and that brought me to the second part of my talk, which I will try to convince you that we don't need new antibiotics. So first I, I want to convince you in the first part that we need new products and now, no, we don't need new products. And um, yes, it's how, how it is. So uh, this is also two industrial projects, two uh, sort of tests from industry. So if you look on palmomycins, they have been discovered in 97, so when I was two years old. And this compound we discovered when my mother was uh, three years old. So, and what happens to these compounds? Nothing. So, this is excellent active compounds. For example, palomycins, they have activity in one digit nanomolar range against multi resistant TB, right? And those have activity also in one digit nanomolar range against uh, multi resistant enterococcin. But nothing happened. Vancomycin resistant, for example. Why? And then the first, uh, the first project is, I think, those one, though they delivery problem, supply problem. So these compounds have been isolated, NMR have been performed, structurally sedated, then a few milligrams have been tested, and that's it. So, and, and that's where usually scientists stop. Right? They publish an Givante paper, and then, and then they don't uh, proceed farther. And industry want to pick it up, they meet the huge problem, they cannot really get compounds for, for other development, because you need, like, first you need 15 milligrams, then you need 100 milligrams, then you need a gram. And, and then if industry cannot ensure the sustainable supply up to this number, they will never start developing this compound. Also, compound is not toxic and extremely active. So, again, we wanted to, to use our simple concept, genetic elements, clusters, chassis. And then, so about this palmomycin, the problem is, huge problem is that we have a, a huge variety of this compound in a mixture. Because 
you see here this all R1, R2, 3 and up to 6. This, is, this can be ethyl malonyl-CoA, methyl malonyl-CoA or malonyl-CoA incorporated and all these combinations gives you 20, 30, 40 compounds, depends on the conditions. And of course to find a particular one in this mixture is a huge challenge. And uh, we express this gene cluster, we in published this, patented this, uh, with, together with industry. And you see this all, all uh, compounds and in this mixture you see like four, five, six compounds of the same mass and so on and so on. Huge problem. And then guess which compound industry wanted to increase. Yes, you are right. I think this one. So they say this is the most interesting compound for us and we want to get the sustainable supply of those. So can you do something about this? So you would not be able to isolate even one milligram of this. So and they need of course much more. We started to do it. So it was a very simple approach. We discussed it yesterday with Rami. I was really happy to, to have a discussion with him. So we took a random, random library of promoters. We took the gene clusters and we said, OK, let's try to disbalance the expression of those and to see whether we can increase the production in general. Our idea was not to increase a particular compound at the beginning, but just to increase completely the production because production is like one milligram per liter, which is absolutely insufficient. And that was the idea, to increase the expression and to, to different extent of different operands. And we were very happy to see that among several hundred clones we need to check. This compound was completely overexpressed, so overproduced. And this was even easy to isolate. So we achieved this relatively easy. So and then we of course tested other cosmids with different with different promoters. And you can see how strongly you can disbalance this expression. So this is a wild type, this production. So this compound is really low production, and you can find several cosmids where it is way more and the others are nearly negligible. Yeah? So this is how, how, how we could manage it. And uh, and at the end this was patented, the compound is is tested, being tested now, and so on. As, as, that's why I can I can present it. So and uh, the same approach we did for, for another compound, butromycin, which I showed you before, which is very interesting antibiotic. Yes? So the same, you take a random library of promoters, you integrate them, you have several hundred exconjugants which you need to test. It was also a big success for us. So this is what is produced by the wild type and this is in heterogous conditions, what we could achieve using additional cluster, using these uh, random promoters. And of course, if you increase the production of the compounds in general in heterologous conditions, so you identify, you are able, will be able to identify also uh, new derivatives of this compound because they also increased and we could isolate all of them and, uh, and, and we could test etc etc. This is very essential point because I think we have a lot of interesting old compounds which have a great activity like palmycin, botromycin, two examples but I can, I can name you now 10, 10 or 20 which are absolutely interesting and uh, giving them second life by, by, by ensuring sustainable supply of this compound. This is also one of the aim, not only get novelty, but also use what we have already since 50 years or 60 years. And uh, because, for example, in this case, this particular case, company now have a, a huge uh, number of, 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 of derivatives also, but, but this is what they do. And they, they use this botrymycin now for, for medicinal chemistry purposes, right? So they can isolate 100 milligram easily and they can derivatize it. So because of course this compound will not go to the clinical trials, but if you derivatize with medicinal chemistry, you might have a chance and improve the properties. But this can be done only when you can produce and supply sufficient amount. Okay, good. So, uh, and uh, that was, it was uh, two, two parts of my talk and I want to, to finish with, with, the, with the third part showing this picture. Because we are speaking about about the expression of gene clusters and particularly about the, the activation of gene clusters. And uh, this remember me is this picture of uh, survival bias. Pe many people will know it, right? When the mathematician uh, Abraham Wald uh, took in the Second World War, took part in the discussion of, of, the, of the officer in, in US Army, why, so how we should strength this kind of aircraft because when it comes back to the base, they, should, they were observing this, all these holes from bullets and they say, okay, we need to strand this part and this part and this part to make it stronger, to have more chances to survive and so on and so on. And this Abraham Wald said, no, no, we should strand this part, right? Because those which are getting holes, bullet holes here, they never come back. And this is exactly what I think about this gene cluster act expression activation survival bias. 
because I'm getting uh, very unhappy if I read successful case of uh, gene cluster activation in the literature, especially if it's uh, uh, highly published, not because I'm jealous, this, this time is, is gone. Just because I think it makes our picture not full what we, when we are speaking about the, about the expression of gene clusters. Because from my experience, and I'm pretty sure that is every lab experienced this, you made like 100 experiments activating gene cluster. You take the promoter, you integrate in front of the operons. In, in 100 times if it will not work, once it works, for unknown reason. And we publish this results and show it as, a, as an example. This is an example how we should go for activation gene cluster. But we are not speaking about this 100 cases where we did exactly the same and it didn't work. And this shift our picture how we should activate, how we should work with the gene clusters because you have 10 papers. So meaning 900 ex ex uh, examples which, uh, which didn't work will be never popping up in the literature. And then of course uh, people say, okay, this is a way to go and activate gene clusters. And if you cannot do it, so something is wrong. But it's absolutely not like that. So then I show you one example from, from our work. Again, the same picture, right? Controlling elements, gene clusters, chassis, right? And uh, so we have a cryptic silent gene cluster, which is not expressed. So what we did, we take a library of different promoters developed in our lab. So we take one of the strongest promoters, integrate it in front of this gene cluster, then changes, put some terminators where it was shown, where it was necessary, put other promoters and so on. And the cluster should be ideally activated. Bingo, we were very happy to see that cluster is activated. So this is, for example, a host with a native cosmid, which is a not activated gene cluster. This is host where the promoters and terminators have been integrated into the gene cluster. We could isolate and perform NMR of all these compounds. And uh, even more, so this was like four new compounds, I think, uh, isolated, several known. We could test them on antimicrobial activity. Could perform, there was some very interesting activity against stuff hours, for example, and so on. Would be great, right? So one should be happy and, and I would be if this gene cluster should not be responsible for this compound, but not for this compound, which we have isolated, right? So it's clear that ensuring the expression or ensuring the transcription of the gene cluster is absolutely not sufficient, right? And if we would know that the gene cluster is responsible for this compound, we would publish this in Nature saying, yeah, we have an activated cryptic gene cluster and we have isolated four new antibiotics with an excellent activity against staph aureus, but this was a proof concept for us. It was an experiment where we want to see how and where we can end. And indeed, we never could isolate this compound, which is supposed to be produced and encoded by this gene cluster. Also, we did transcriptomic of the whole host with this gene cluster, and we for sure know that all genes are expressed, right? And uh, that's, that's where I, I want to end this story, because we need to be much more careful with that. And I think we need to develop much more precise approach to activate gene cluster and to get uh, production of this compound, which is supposed to be encoded by the certain gene cluster. And this is actually the way where, where we are working, um, working on. Okay, I want to thank also my collaborators who helped me in, in, in this work and the funding agencies and especially a lot of companies who still keep some interest in this work and, and we are pushing together this. And, and hoping that we can give a chance, this new technology for the development and, and finding new natural products. And of course, I want to thank you for your attention.
It's really an honor to be here. Thanks for the invitation. It's uh, really a very interesting crowd as well, so I'm uh, very pleased to, to give this talk. Um, I slightly modified the title a bit from computational genomic approaches to omics approaches because after some discussions yesterday I decided also to include some uh, computational metabolomics uh, which we've started doing in my group uh, within the last year as well. Um, but basically what I want to talk about is how can we leverage all these large scale genomic and metabolomic data sets to accelerate natural product discovery and get a better handle on all this metabolic diversity to really target antibiotic discovery. Uh, because it was already clear from uh, David's talk and, and Andri's talk that there is lots of diversity out there, but it's, there are still quite a, a number of challenges on how to really uh, use, utilize and exploit that diversity. So for us, a key handle of uh, understanding natural product uh, diversity and, and chemical structure diversity is by looking at the genomes of their uh, producers. And the key units in this are what we call biosynthetic gene clusters. And it's really nice to see and very useful to see that often what you see in the chemistry of different natural products uh, is reflected in the composition, the gene composition of these gene clusters, which encode all the enzymes that are necessary to build up and construct these molecules. So for example, if you look at some of the molecules that are here on the screen, uh, for example, ribodyrid has this coumarin group, which it shares with simocyclinon, which was also shown by Andri in his presentation. And it's nice to see that actually the, the chemistry is shared when, when you compare the gene clusters, there's actually also groups of genes shared that are actually involved in uh, building and attaching that chemical moiety. Similarly, the, this nitro sugar is shared between ribodyrin and everdenomycin, and you'll see that the corresponding genes are shared between their gene clusters. Um, and for example, this arsenic acid is shared between polyketomycin and everdenomycin, and the corresponding brown genes here are homologous between their gene clusters. So by looking at the gene clusters, we can already get an idea of well, what kind of diversity is out there uh, in terms of natural product chemistry. The first step in this process is, of course, identification of these gene clusters. And um, as Alexander mentioned during my PhD, I, uh, together with uh, Kai Blin and Thelman Weber, who were at that time in uh, Tübingen in Germany and are currently in Copenhagen in Denmark, uh, we developed AntiSmash, which is a, a web server that automates the identification and computational analysis of these biosynthetic gene clusters. And together with, the, with them, we keep on coordinating the development of this uh, tool, which is also publicly available on a web server, uh, which has been used around 350,000 times now. So lots of people are using this, it uses a lot of computational resources. It basically auto automates the identification of these biosynthetic gene clusters. So here's an example output of Streptomyces silicolor, the model actinomycete. You see here 25 gene clusters being identified by AntiSmash. Cluster 10 is currently selected. You'll see the genes here that in this case encode uh, an NRPS, uh, non-ribosomal peptide synthetase biosynthetic pathway. And for the actual NRPS enzymes, you'll also see the uh, modular domain uh, structure of those enzymes with which, based on the subset specificity prediction of certain domains within those enzymes, we can already predict kind of a core uh, structure of the molecule. So, of course, it's nice to be able to automatically identify all these gene clusters, but of course, the second key step uh, is also to be able to kind of dereplicate these gene clusters at the genetic level to see, okay, if I put a genome through AntiSmash, the gene clusters that I find there, are they similar to any gene clusters for which we know the function? And this used to be actually a very um, big challenge because the information on all those gene clusters was scattered through the literature of a few decades. Um, so that's why during my postdoctoral 
um, fellowship in, in Bremen at the uh, MPI, I coordinated a large community effort to basically pull all that information together, together with more than 80 research groups worldwide. We, we did this and uh, we basically uh, standardize the way in which these gene clusters can be annotated and according to that new data standard for annotation of biosynthetic gene clusters we together also annotated uh, more than 1200 uh, biosynthetic gene clusters and since then, since then the MIBIG minimum information for on a biosynthetic gene cluster repository has been updated to now contain almost 2000 uh, biosynthetic gene clusters that have been linked to structures. So this, of course, is coupled back to anti-smash, uh, so that whenever you now put a genome through anti-smash and you identify a gene cluster, it is compared with all the biosynthetic gene clusters in this MIBIG repository, for which we know the, the uh, chemical products, uh, and you get a, a ranked list of the most similar known gene clusters to which your gene cluster of interest, the gene cluster that you detect, is, is similar to. Uh, so this is a way in which you can quickly see whether, for example, a gene cluster of interest is either identical or more or less identical to a known gene cluster, in which case it's not very interesting, or it is slightly different, in which case it could be interesting because it could lead to the production of a novel derivative, or perhaps it's, it doesn't look like anything we know, um, in which case it could still produce a known compound like Andre has shown, uh, but uh, at least at the genetic level we do not know any biosynthetic gene cluster or pathway um, that uh, is similar to the gene cluster that you then find. So basically this pipeline automates uh, a large part of the computational genome analysis of these biosynthetic gene clusters, but there is one big uh, problem here because the field and, and the development of, of omics data has not stood still in the past years. When I developed anti-smash, the way people were doing science with genomes was sequencing one genome. And then I knew at that time there was one group in, in the US that sequenced uh, uh, like a dazzling number of 20 streptomyces genomes. And it was just amazing. And, and currently that's just peanuts uh, because people are looking at much bigger data sets. So for example, with uh, Alexander and, uh, and Jan Song from, from Sintef, uh, we yesterday had a, a project meeting with their project in which we're looking at, well, I, here it says a thousand, but now with an, uh, some additions, it's now even more than 1200 actinobacterial genomes. We're talking about more than 25,000 biosynthetic gene clusters. Um, so the way to study this is well, we need something more than just anti-smash because looking through 1200 uh, outputs of se separate outputs of individual genomes and trying to make sense of that is just undoable. Uh, it would take months of boring work and you would probably not be able to find the really interesting bits. We need new ways to be able to uh, look at that data. And it's not only the large numbers of genomes that, is, uh, that, uh, that are a problem for this traditional approach. Also, metagenomes are delivering very large numbers of uh, biosynthetic gene clusters. Uh, so I think um, David already gave a, a nice example of a large metagenomic data set of uh, 256 uh, gigabytes. There was another recent study by the, the Bork lab where they sequenced also uh, like 200 so soils from all over the world, enormous masses of sequence information that could potentially be leveraged to, um, to look at new uh, biosynthetic diversity. So there's lots of those data sets coming out there. One other bottleneck you have with metagenomics, especially with the shotgun metagenomics, is that it's very difficult to assemble uh, complete biosynthetic gene clusters from those data. Um, basically because of the, the complexity uh, of these microbial communities, but also because the, many of the biosynthetic gene clusters are very uh, repetitive. For example, polyketide synthases and non-ribosomal peptide synthases have kind of repetitive domain structures that make it very difficult to uh, assemble them. So we've uh, recently worked with a group of uh, Pavel Pevsner in, 
He has a, actually a lab both in, at UCSD in San Diego, also in St. Petersburg, to um, come up with a new assembly algorithm that is specifically focused on uh, being able to complete these kinds of myosynthetic gene clusters. So actually what you get when you normally assemble uh, a complex metagenomic assembly are small contigs. These contigs are taken from an assembly graph in which, well, uh, I will spare you the computational details, but based on KMERS, kind of, uh, you will get stretches of DNA and that can be linked to each other. And for example, this stretch from here to here would be a large contig. And for example, this gene cluster here, which encodes the biosynthesis of a lipopeptide, and the assembly graph is actually split into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten separate contigs. Uh, and normally, if you don't look at this graph, which nobody really does, unless uh, you're really good at this kind of stuff, um, you would just look at these small separate contigs, and you would know, would even know, have no idea that they belong to the same gene cluster. But now, this biosynthetic spades algorithm, which was developed by Dmitry uh, Maleshko from Pavel's group, together with PhD student in my lab, Vitalia Takana, it basically looks at these graphs and reconstructs the most probable paths here from basically the start of the gene cluster to the end of the gene cluster. And in this way, it's able to kind of reconstruct uh, the most likely actual sequence of the full biosynthetic gene cluster. And based on, uh, on reference genome information, if sometimes you have multiple possible paths through the graph, it can uh, basically pinpoint the most likely uh, order of those contigs and uh, the pieces in between. So you get really complete uh, gene cluster information. And we've tried this on a number of metagenomes and this really allows you to get large numbers of uh, pretty complete uh, biosynthetic gene clusters from metagenomes. So what this all means is basically using these large scale strain collection, genome collections, uh, large metagenomes, we get access to thousands of biosynthetic gene clusters and this is enormous diversity to wade through. And we need targeted approaches to be able to get a bird's eye perspective of that uh, diversity and to be able to explore that effectively. So one technique that uh, I developed together with uh, Peter Chiramanchich at uh, Michael Fishback's lab when I was visiting Michael's lab in San Francisco during my PhD is um, basically a technique using sequence similarity networks. So in this is a network of all the biosynthetic gene clusters in around 1,000 genomes. And here each node represents one biosynthetic gene cluster. And here the colors of the nodes uh, indicate uh, what kind, what biosynthetic class of gene cluster each node represents. So the nodes are connected based on a similarity metric. So when uh, two gene clusters are more similar than a certain cutoff, uh, then they would be connected. And the similarity metric here includes uh, several items such as uh, uh, domain content, protein domain content of the gene clusters, their order and their uh, sequence identity, identity optionally. And by doing this, you can also use the known gene clusters, currently the ones that are in MIBIG, put them into the network, and you would actually be able to see that, for example, this is a region where we already know most of the biosynthetic gene clusters, where, for example, here is another region of the biosynthetic space where we haven't really characterized any uh, biosynthetic gene clusters experimentally. So this allows you to, to identify and target kind of uh, unknown spaces of biosynthetic diversity. So another thing that you're able to do with this is uh, using the same kind of di distance metrics and there was actually uh, several labs that have in parallel uh, constructed similar distance metrics, you're able to group large numbers of biosynthetic gene clusters in what we call gene cluster families. So in now each gene cluster family would basically um, contain all the biosynthetic gene clusters that make either the same or highly similar um, natural products. And this also allows you to get a better grip of the diversity and also see, for example, which strains have similar gene clusters of a particular kind. So in the, in the past uh, two years or so, uh, or three years, we've 
kind of completely automated this approach into a fully uh, comprehensive workflow that interacts smoothly with our anti-smash by synthetic gene cluster identification tool and the MIBIG reference database. And we launched two new tools called Bigscape and Corazon. Corazon was uh, built by Nelly Sea Moica from uh, the group of Paco Barana Gomez in Mexico. And so what happens here is first you have a bunch of genomes, you run them through anti-smash, you get all your gene clusters, you add reference gene clusters of known function from MIBIG, then you run them through, through Bigscape, and Bigscape automatically reconstructs sequence similarity networks of all your gene clusters, including the reference clusters, and groups them into families. In some cases, they will be families without reference gene clusters, so families of unknown function, and in some cases, they will be families with reference gene clusters that do have gene clusters of unknown function. And then, subsequently, what Corazon can do for you is take, for example, a gene cluster family of interest and reconstruct a multi-locus phylogeny of all the members of all the gene clusters within that family so that you can see how all those gene clusters are actually evolutionarily related to each other um, to, see, to basically look at their diversity at a, at a higher resolution. So but to, to be able to make this really smooth and to be able to make this doable, we also needed to um, make a number of computational improvements because in the original studies that launched these sequence similarity network and gene cluster family approaches, uh, if you would take a thousand genomes, you would basically need a supercomputer to crunch these data for um, two months or something and then you would get your data back. Um, but we wanted this to become available for everyone and uh, we wanted to make it possible to run it on your own laptop within a few hours at, at most. And I'm very glad that in the end we're uh, able to do this uh, through a few tricks, a few tricks that were already there previously and a few new tricks. Uh, one key trick is that basically from a sequence of nucleotides we compress gene clusters to a string of protein domains, which are kind of the, um, the functional, uh, which re represent the functional content of each gene cluster. And then we have distance metrics that uh, basically compare these gene clusters, for example, first by looking at the protein domain content in one gene cluster and another gene cluster and looking for the shared portion. Uh, we can do the same to look at gene order by looking for pairs of adjacent domains and looking how many adjacent pairs are being shared. But the most tricky part was using sequence identity because for the previous approaches, uh, the supercomputers were especially needed to be able to align like thousands of protein domains to each other in big all versus all multiple sequence alignments. And this just took ages. Um, so the, the problem here is that this is a uh, bit of computer science. This is an all versus all pro problem and this scales quadratically, so if you add more gene clusters uh, you would get quadratically more uh, compute time because the number of comparisons in a two-dimensional matrix would scale uh, exponentially, um, well with a, at least an exponent of two. Um, so we've basically changed this by going from an all versus all comparison to comparing all versus a profile. So for each of those PFAM domains, there's basically a model, a sequence model that uh, basically can function as a, uh, as a reference for the alignment. And then all what, you can, all what you then need to do is take this sequence model and then you align one sequence to it, another sequence, another sequence, another sequence, etc. So because you don't align the sequences against each other, but only against this model, it's called the profile hidden Markov model, um, this makes it from an all versus all problem into an all versus this single model problem. And this, basically this key trick sped up, uh, especially the large searches from months on supercomputers to two hours on a laptop computer. So actually this weekend I ran uh, an analysis on the 1200 genomes from Sintev and it took on my laptop computer over here, it took uh, about three to four hours to look at all the um, uh, like 25,000 bisynthetic gene clusters. So that's pretty quick, I would say. Um, 
Finally, one final trick that we implemented um, has to do with comparing gene clusters and especially in metagenomes and in draft genomes, often the clusters are fragmented, so they still end at a contact edge, even after the tricks that we can do with myosynthetic spades. So the problem there is if you compare fragments to complete gene clusters, it's difficult how to really make a, a fair comparison. You cannot really compare globally, like the whole gene cluster versus the fragment and, uh, and only look at the shared part. Um, but you also do not want to um, basically look, uh, or so only look at the, um, so if you compare locally, you would only look at the shared part. If you compare globally, you would penalize the fragmented gene cluster for not having all the other domains that are actually not part of it due, due to the fragmentation. So the, the solution for this is what we call global alignment, in which we first look for the best local match very quickly using a, a fast algorithm called the longest common substring search. And then we extend the alignment to two sides to the nearest uh, gene cluster border, uh, which could be a contact border. And then we look at the corresponding pieces in both gene clusters um, so that you really compare the part that should correspond, but not only the local best matching part. And this is a, a nice uh, way that kind of hovers in between the global and local alignments and, and really works well to also align the MI big gene clusters to the uh, anti-smash clusters. So we validated this, of course, on uh, a large scale by looking at uh, uh, 248 natural products from MIB clusters that we could group into, uh, based on literature, into 93 curated groupings. And we saw that Bigscape was able to accurately recapitulate those groupings. And this also allows you to basically look at the data and see, for example, if you have gene clusters of interest, whether they will collate, for example, with uh, gene clusters of known uh, product classes. And in this way, these four uh, gene clusters here would be new, possibly new uh, glycopeptides, at least they warrant a, a further look if you're looking for new glycopeptides. So it's a, of course uh, important to also make the, uh, the data analysis then accessible. And for that we, uh, and particularly Satria and my group, build a, a user interface to be able to explore the output. So you get an overview of here gene cluster families versus uh, genomes, and then you can go, for example, to the network of a particular product uh, class, for example, the type 1 polyketide synthesis, and here you get a visualization of the network. You can select certain gene clusters of interest or hover over them to see their names, or look, for example, for a gene cluster of interest from MIBIG, a reference cluster, which We'll then highlight and you'll see the corresponding gene cluster family around it and then you can go to the family and here you get the Corazon uh, phylogeny of all those gene clusters see, to see how they are related to each other and when you hover over them do you see the protein domains etc and in this way you can very quickly ex explore all of these networks. So Bigscape has already been quickly adopted by the scientific community. There's lots of labs that have already started using it even before publication. So we're, we're happy with that. This is a nice example uh, of uh, the groups of Jörn Peel and Julia Vohal that used it on the plant microbiome data set. And so for Corazon, uh, which makes these phylogenies, there's one other thing that is really cool uh, that you can do with this. You can also take any gene of interest from your uh, gene cluster of interest, then basically look for all the different contexts in which you find uh, this gene together with uh, at least one other gene in the gene cluster and identify, for example, different gene cluster families that have, um, that have this gene together with, other, with at least one other gene in the cluster to be able to look uh, at how that particular enzyme family evolved uh, in what kind of uh, gene cluster content. So to be able to um, look at this in, uh, and in, a, in a case study to see how, how we could use these tools, we 
looked at a, at a natural product family called the Detoxins and Ramosomites, together with a group of Neil Kelleher, and in particular the postdoc there, Michael Maloney, who worked at this. And he had seen from uh, mass spec data, and this is a, a network that he could generate from the mass spec data, that this is a very diverse family of natural products. So there is a lot of molecular diversity, dozens of different uh, variants ac across lots of different strains. And we were able to see also using Bigscape that there were actually a number of different clades in our network uh, that correspond to different subfamilies uh, for ramazamide and the toxin production. And when using Corazon, we made a large tree of the detoxin ramosamide superfamily, uh, gene cluster superfamily, uh, we were able to see that different kind of branches of this tree, different subfamilies, also had slightly variations in enzyme content. Um, for example, uh, this amicalotopsis clade has, uh, has certain uh, P450 hydroxylases that the others do not have, and the clade here also has certain tailoring enzymes that the, these two known uh, clades do not have. And based on the mass spec and NMR analysis, we were able to see that indeed all of these clades lead to the production of different variants of those molecules. So what's also really useful is that you can use these gene cluster families and, for example, also correlate them, uh, correlate the presence of members of a gene cluster family with the observation of specific peaks in your uh, mass spectrometry data. Uh, and this is what uh, the groups of, of, of Neil Keller and, and Bill Metcalf have done for a while now. And also we've shown together with them that when we use Bigscape, this also works well for, for many natural products. So we get a, like a, a, a strong correlation score between observing a specific mass peak for those molecules and observing their gene cluster. So basically the idea is if you very often find uh, a certain mass peak of interest uh, in the same strains where you also see a particular gene cluster, uh, in many cases that's not by chance, but it's because the, actually the cluster is responsible for making that molecule. And this you can use to prioritize. But we can do more than that. Um, using uh, mass spec data, you can also create networks similar to what we can do with gene clusters. You can create uh, also molecular networks. And this is based on the fragmentation pattern of these molecules. So uh, what you can generate are, are tandem uh, MS spectra in which you kind of get an idea of uh, the, the fragments that arise when you shoot uh, on those molecules and you, you fragment them using ionization. And then based on the uh, similarities between the spectra for different molecules, you can group the molecules uh, also in a network in which the differences in a network, uh, the, the nodes would usually also correspond to distinct mass shifts or mass differences between different molecular variants. And now of course uh, the big challenge is to be able to kind of compare the molecular networks with the gene cluster networks. So to link families of molecules to families of gene clusters at a large scale. So there's two uh, possible ways to do that. Uh, so first of all, of course, we have the sequence data. We predict the gene clusters. We cluster them into gene cluster families with the MS data. We have MSMS data. We use spectral clustering and, and generate molecular families. And then there's two ways to map those to each other. The first is correlation, which is similar to what I've shown before, but then looking for a correlation between, not between gene cluster families and specific mass peaks, but between gene cluster families and molecule families. Uh, and the second is feature-based mapping in which um, you predict from the gene clusters certain chemical features that you can predict are going to be present in the products. And you try to link that with uh, chemical features that you can predict based on, uh, for example, fragmentation patterns and mass shift in the MS data. So this we call feature-based mapping. We're currently uh, developing this technology. A key step in this technology is, of course, that you need to really annotate uh, these networks to, to identify these chemical features. And for example, um, Justin in my, in my group has been working with um, uh, Kyo Min Kang and Madeleine Ernst from Peter Dollestein's lab on a new method that takes molecular networks and uh, uses motifs, 
specific motifs that are linked to specific uh, substructures in those molecules. For example, this would be, uh, or the green one here, would be a, a motif of two peaks that are linked to vanillic acid. So if your molecule fragments and you get those peaks, it's very likely that you have a vanillic acid in your molecule. Um, and using those motifs, you can annotate the networks and uh, identify where certain substru substructures are found in which molecules. And this has now been also uh, um, generalized in a, in, a, in a pipeline in which you have MSMS spectra, you do this MSMS molecular networking, um, and then you use the, both the motifs and also reference spectra, so uh, actually the spectra for known molecules that have been annotated in this GNPS uh, database from UCSD. Um, and these reference data you can also use to basically get a chemical classification of, and that's indicated here by the colors in the molecular network, chemical classification of structures using a, an algorithm called classifier. And when you combine the motif analysis with this chemical class level annotation, you really get highly annotated molecular networks, uh, also with a lot of molecular features. At the same time, we can do something similar for gene clusters. For example, uh, together with Jörn Peel's lab, we've generated a, um, an algorithm that's able to predict specific, um, basically the structures for trans-AT polyketides and, and look at their diversity based on how the domains involved in putting together those, uh, those molecules, how they clade in their phylogenies. Um, and we also develop machine learning approaches that are able to predict the, the substrates for non-ribosomal peptide synthetases, the amino acids that are being incorporated in these NRPSs. And we've already shown together with the lab of Peter Dorosein that um, you can use this information to link uh, lots of uh, uh, basically molecules from large-scale metabolomic data to gene cluster families. So uh, Peter Dorosein's group has recently um, done large-scale metabolomic profiling of a few hundred uh, Zeudomonas strains and those contain a number of uh, lipopeptides that are known to be also antimicrobial in many cases or antifungal um, and there were in the molecular network so uh, a number of new, uh, new masses that were clear from the molecular network that they were different from the, from the known molecules so here the blue ones and the uh, um, orange ones were known families and the purple ones and these red ones were, were new so they had not been annotated before. And using an algorithm that matches the mass shifts for the amino acids in the mass spec data with the predicted amino acids in the gene clusters we were able to link those molecules semi-automatically to gene clusters. So the next step uh, after being able to predict and link monomers uh, like amino acids between uh, molecular networks and gene cluster networks is also going further by predicting uh, at large scale also tailoring reactions from gene clusters. Uh, and the biggest difficulty here is that we also need to predict where those tailoring reactions will actually do their thing on the natural product structure. Um, the good thing is that there seems to be quite some phylogenetic signal in this regioselectivity. So for example, if we have here the WS9326 biosynthetic gene cluster, and we have an O-methyl transferase that here methylates this tyrosine here in the structure, and we look at other NRPS gene clusters where we see uh, a closely related O-methyl transferase, here in the Fegley-Mycin, or the, sorry, the, yeah, the Fegley-Mycin gene cluster, uh, sorry, this is the Marformycin gene cluster, um, we see a similar methyl transferase, that on a completely different molecule also methylates the uh, hydroxy group of a, of a tyrosine. So um, we can actually use this and other information to also try to predict the regioselectivity for those kinds of enzymes. At the same time, we often see that uh, gene clusters contain, like I showed at the start also, different subclusters that encode the biosynthesis of specific moieties that are incorporated in these natural product structures. And we see that those can also evolve into different variants that are linked to different chemical variants of those, um, of those uh, chemical substructures. So for example, 
uh, we see here different variants of those uh, subclusters that, for example, have, have or do not have these methyltransferases. And, for example, having a methyltransferase or not would make the difference between this 3HA or the uh, 4MHA. And um, using the variation between subclusters and substructures, we're now uh, well, trying to automatically predict uh, those chemical features. And ideally, when we then predict the structural features from the gene cluster, so we get a list of structural features that are predicted, we can link those, we can match them to observed structural features. And in many cases, uh, we can see, even though our predictions are not perfect, that there is a good match that is really beyond chance. And then we can start learning from the data. So saying that this would be our prediction based on the gene cluster, that this would be what we kind of observe in the metabolomic data. We can then go back and retrain the algorithm by saying, okay, our predicted structural features were not perfect. So the phenylalanine was actually another aromatic amino acid. It was actually a tyrosine. Uh, this one, we had no clue what it was. It was this exotic amino acid, kininurine. Um, so in this way, we would be able to uh, iteratively learn from the data and improve those predictions to really uh, combine genomic and metabolomic data and effectively really exploit those large uh, kinds of data sets. Okay, with that I want to end and thank uh, the members of my research group, uh, in particular uh, Jorge who worked on Bigscape, uh, Barbara, Satria, Justin and these master students over here who worked on the work that I presented today. And I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you.